After the Civil War, during the period called Reconstruction, a group known as the Ku Klux Klan was formed. Its purpose was to terrorize the newly freed slaves and prevent their economic and social integration into American society. Having largely achieved its goal, the Klan gradually faded away. But then, in 1915, motivated by D.W. Griffith's blockbuster racist movie, Birth of a Nation, a new clan was born. While not as violent, the second clan became more successful. Something like 15% of all white Americans became members. In no other state was the clan more popular and powerful than it was in Indiana, where in some counties, a quarter or more of white males joined the group in the 1920s. The meteoric rise of the clan in Indiana was due primarily to a man named David Curtis Stevenson. This is his story. In 1891, Stevenson was born to sharecroppers in Houston, Texas. He attended Catholic and Methodist schools. As a young man, he traveled the country promoting socialism and then working in the newspaper business. He soon gained a reputation as a brash-talking and hard-drinking man with an eye for the ladies. He married in 1915 and fathered a child, but soon abandoned his family, stole money from an employer, and hit the road. Stevenson became a silver-tongued success as a coal salesman and in 1920 made his first connection with the Ku Klux Klan after moving to Evansville, Indiana. He recognized the money-making potential of the Klan and pitched in to promote the organization. He also married for the second of four times. While the 1800s Klan largely focused on blacks, the 1920s Klan was more complex. It stood for a blend of patriotism, equality of the sexes, moral virtue, and Protestant religion. It was aggressively anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, and anti-Jewish. It also strongly supported alcohol prohibition and civic responsibility. Naturally, the Klan also supported racial segregation and discrimination. The Klan recruited many of its members from sympathetic churches and formed close relationships with ministers who promoted the group. Its members would sometimes make surprise visits to favored churches during Sunday services to donate money and promote their cause. The Klan's headquarters was in Atlanta, where the leadership noted Stevenson's promotional talents and moved him to Indianapolis to organize the state's leading city. Stevenson's reputation spread as he quickly grew Klan membership in Indianapolis and the rest of the state. With its growth came political influence that rankled some politicians. The mayor of Indianapolis strongly opposed the Klan until it eventually backed a candidate who defeated his re-election. By 1923, Indiana became the leading Klan state, largely due to Stevenson. His focus on moral virtue was especially attractive to white Protestants who detested what they saw as the moral decline of the Jazz era and feared the large influx of European immigrants. The Klan often operated like a private moral enforcement agency, sometimes administering brutal justice to men who cheated on their wives or were notorious drunks. In his own public statements, Stevenson tended to downplay the Klan's more controversial positions in favor of his message of 100% Americanism and moral purity. There were plenty of other Klan leaders to do the dirty work of preaching hatred of immigrants, Catholics, and Jews, while Stevenson remained aloof. Even Stevenson couldn't resist the cross-burning that inspired the membership, however. While Hoosier Klan membership ballooned, Stevenson gained from personal power and wealth. He became a millionaire from the sale of clan robes and membership fees. Even smaller Indiana towns like Valparaiso and Richmond were able to host clan events with thousands of attendees, attesting to the clan's drawing power. Politicians didn't fail to notice the clan's clout, and mostly through the Republican Party, the organization soon controlled the governor, the state legislature, and many local governments throughout the state. 
D.C. Stevenson have become Indiana's political kingmaker. What is thought to be the largest meeting in the history of the Ku Klux Klan happened in Kokomo, Indiana on July 4, 1923. Crowd estimates vary greatly, but up to 200,000 Kluxers turned out for the big event on the outskirts of the town of just 30,000 residents. The scene was Malfalfa Park, where I am now, and the main event was the elevation of D.C. Stevenson to the position of Grand Dragon of the Klan in Indiana and 22 other northern states. The robed and hooded Klansmen and Klanswomen sang patriotic songs, prayed and cheered speeches blasting immigrants, Catholics, Jews, and anyone who opposed the 100% Americanism of the Klan. With perfect choreography, Stevenson arrived by plane to address the cheering throng and receive the golden robe and hood of the Grand Dragon. The day-long festival was followed by a parade through Kokomo featuring Klan officials on horseback, a dozen floats, and a 40-piece band playing patriotic and religious songs, including the Klan's unofficial anthem, Onward Christian Soldiers. Nobody could know at the time that this was to be both the Klan's moment of glory and its poison pill. By elevating the hypocrite and hustler Stevenson to the powerful dragon post, the organization was sealing its own doom. But on this day in Kokomo, Stevenson was the most powerful man in Indiana and the Klan its most powerful organization. Stevenson wasn't shy about flaunting his ill-begotten wealth. He bought a 98-foot yacht for $55,000, on which he entertained politicians and many women who he promised to marry and then jilted. He also bought a large house. In July of 1923, just two months after Stevenson was installed as Grand Dragon, he bought this large old house in Irvington, which is now East Side Indianapolis. To remodel the house, Stevenson spent $22,000, equal to almost $300,000 in today's money. He made it look like the Klan Imperial Palace in Atlanta. The house was located near Old Butler College. Stevenson spared no expense, making it an important place to entertain the political and social dignitaries he wanted the Klan to influence. Just as quickly as Stevenson had risen, he now began his fall. His second wife divorced him, claiming that he had cruelly abused her. In April of 1924, when he was at the peak of his political power, the Atlanta Klan headquarters booted him out of the organization. Klan leaders thought that Stevenson was stealing money, and some didn't approve of his linking of the KKK to politicians. He was replaced by a Republican attorney from Liberty, Indiana, Walter Bossert. In May, Stevenson announced he was starting his own Klan organization to compete with Atlanta. He found it tough going though, as most local organizations chose to stick with the National Klan. Stevenson had made plenty of Klan enemies during his rise to power and short stay at the top, but the worst was yet to come. In March of 1925, Stevenson's notorious womanizing and boozing caught up with him. After several attempts to woo her, he convinced Madge Oberholzer, whose family also lived in Irvington, to visit him at his house. He told her he wanted to discuss a job offer. He and his lieutenants then forced whiskey on her until she passed out and kidnapped Oberholzer. They took her on a train bound for Chicago. On the way, Stevenson brutally beat and violated the woman, viciously biting her. When the train arrived in Hammond, Oberholzer was allowed to visit a drugstore where she bought some pills she took to kill herself. On April 14, 1928, Madge Oberholzer died from kidney failure, but not before she signed a deathbed statement describing what Stevenson had done to her. Stevenson was indicted on charges of rape and second degree murder. The effect on the Klan was quick and devastating and membership quickly began to decline. The puritanical Klan members were shocked 
that the man they had naively followed was, in reality, a brutal scoundrel. In November 1925, Stevenson was put on trial. It was at this Noblesville, Indiana courthouse on November 14, 1925, that David Curtis Stevenson was convicted of the murder of Madge Oberholzer by a jury of 12 white men. The next day, he was sentenced to imprisonment for life. Stevenson thought Governor Ed Jackson would grant him clemency, and when that didn't happen, the former Klan leader released documents that showed that he had bribed several politicians who were later prosecuted. The Klan-backed mayor of Indianapolis served time in jail on a bribery conviction. Stevenson spent the next quarter century in prison. He was paroled in 1950, but soon violated his parole and spent another six years behind bars. He was finally released for good and told to leave the state in 1956. He died 10 years later in Tennessee, where he had married for a fourth time. By 1928, Indiana Klan membership had dropped by over 98% from its peak. Just as he had killed Madge Oberholzer, D.C. Stevenson killed the Klan that had made him rich and powerful. This is Sophia Martin. Be seeing you!